Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Welcome to the Space Physics and Aeronomy Van Allen Lecture. The Van Allen Lecture is part of the Bowie Lecture Series. Since uh, space physics and aeronomy consists of three different uh, sections, the heliosphere, the magnetosphere, and the ionosphere, uh, we have a sequence of three distinguished lectures that, uh, for each of those regions. Uh, the last one uh, was in the spring meeting. Uh, that was uh, the Parker Lecture. We're very honored uh, to have the opportunity to uh, uh, present one of our distinguished magnetospheric physicists, Vitenis Vassilionis. I should uh, mention that uh, this is a very distinguished award that the uh, space physics and aeronomy section takes very seriously. We uh, wrangle over how this uh, decision will be made and usually we're pretty nearly unanimous by the time we're done with this process and that, uh, that's very good. Uh, to introduce uh, the, uh, today's speaker, I've asked uh, Dr. George Sisko, who has worked with Vitenis for many, many years, to tell you a little bit of the history of Vitenis and his achievements. So, George, if you'll come up here. Now, for me to introduce uh, Vitenis Vassilounis is a little strange because he is probably better known to most of you than I am. Nonetheless, it is perhaps appropriate for me to offer a few um, remarks as background to this 2008 Van Allen Lecture because I've known our distinguished speaker since we shared a graduate student office at MIT in the 1960s. Vitanis has a truly remarkable history. He was born in, in uh, Lithuania in the same months as the outbreak of the Second World War, as a result of which he and his family spent time in displaced persons camps in Germany and Austria before finally moving to Colombia, South America, after which, after four years, they emigrated again to the United States to uh, Lawrence, Massachusetts, which was convenient because that meant that Vitanus could attend local schools. He graduated cum laude with a B.H. degree in physics from Harvard University and then got his Ph.D. from MIT. He remained at MIT as a faculty member uh, during which time, because of his work on magnetosphere ionosphere coupling, he received the McIlwain Medal from the AGU. And then shortly after that, he went to the Max Planck Institute for Aeronomy in Katlenburg, Lindau, where he served as a co-director for 30 years. He's now retired because of the retirement uh, requirements in Germany, and, uh, but he's not retired actually from, from research. As highlights of his professional career, I'd point out that probably you don't know, he actually started out as a data analyzer. His first paper was on the, on the survey of low energy electrons in the magnetosphere obtained from data from the Ogles 1 and 3 spacecraft. He then became an instrument designer. He designed the plasma instrument that's on the Voyager spacecraft, one of which is still working in the outer, mag in the outer heliosphere, in the helio sheath. And then he became a theorist. And he's, one of his first papers was a major contribution to magnetic merging in which he did, made a precise formulation of the Petschek mechanism and connected all of the then known merging ideas in one family tree in parameter space. Probably his most referenced work, the one we know the most, is his work on the magnetosphere coupling, which he, in which he uh, devised the Vassilounis equation, so-called, which is at the heart of the Rice convection model. And this is the workhorse for doing computations for the uh, convection of the plasma sheet into the magnetosphere. This particular model gave rise to the uh, idea of the region of one and two currents. He actually predicted those. And then he went into kind of magnetospheric scaling and dimensional analysis to critique ideas of, of energy transfer into the magnetosphere and to form a basis for comparative magnetospheric studies. He um, worked on the merging geometry and rotation-dominated magnetospheres and gave rise to what's now called the uh, Vassiluna cell. And so his is one of three cells which are um, named which deal with the macroscale convection inside of large geophysical systems, the Hadley cell in the Earth's troposphere, the Dungy cell in the Earth's magnetosphere, and the Vassiluna cell in rotating magnetospheres. 
Then he moved on to the solar wind magnetosphere ionosphere coupling, which is sort of where he is now. And that's what we're going to hear a lot about today. But sort of in connection with that, he joined forces with uh, Eugene Parker in essentially trying to convince people to replace the EJ paradigm, so-called, with the VB paradigm, and you'll hear a lot more about that today. And I've gone through this history of his achievements precisely because you're going to hear a lot more about that today, and because I wanted to point out that he actually lives two lives. And the other life you don't, probably don't know as much about. Most of the people in the world, probably, who know Vatanus Vasilunas know of him as a musician, as an organist. We are a minority of the people who know about, about Vatanus Vasilunas. Um, oh, I need to make no, a transfer here. He studied music because his father was a famous violinist, Isidore Vasilunas. He studied music uh, from a very early age. He went to the Columbia Conservatory when they were in South America, to the New England Conservatory of Music here in the United States. He's given over 300 concerts in the U.S. and Germany. Uh, I wanted to point this out first. If you look at Vasilunas on, Wiki on the Wikipedia, this is what you find. First of all, since he's Lithuanian, he comes out in, in uh, Lithuanian. And the it's Wikipedia, that is the description of Vitanis's essentially musical career, although it does mention uh, as an afterthought that he's a geophysicist. <laughs> The, uh, and it points out that he's given over 300 concerts in the U.S. and Germany. That's what this next slide is. Here he is giving a concert in Göttingen. Uh, Belgium, Sweden, Austria, Colombia, Chile, Norway, Australia, Denmark, Great Britain, Finland, Latvia, Estonia, and Israel, including one concert at the uh, Carnegie Hall in New York City. Um, well, you can imagine being a professional and, and an achievement, high achiever in two different, totally different, non-overlapping fields, that he didn't have time for a family, so he remained a bachelor most of his life, until one day, according to Ian Axford, he showed up at the Mox Pond Institute, married to a beautiful opera star. She has performed at the New York Metropolitan Opera and in many places in Europe, including Munich, which turns out to be her favorite city. So when Vitanus retired, she dragged him and his organ back to a suburb of, uh, of Munich. And this is their house in Munich with the organ downstairs. This house contains his library, which is very interesting because it turns out he's quite a, a fan of classical literature like Sir Walter Scott and good s science fiction, science fiction written by people like C.S. Lewis and even Fred Hoyle, whose book, uh, The Black Cloud, he likes to quote. But he's, he's a fan of science fiction, but he's not a fan of scientific fiction, which is the, what he finds <laughs> in journals and meetings like this. And I know many of the people in this room, including me, know that deep sense of, that deep sinking feeling in the pit of one's stomach and the weak knees that comes when you've just finished giving a talk and Vatanus Vasilunas, sitting in the first row, rises to ask a question. <laughs> it's like being in a desert alone. And as a python rose, rises just in front of you with its wings spread, and you know there's a high probability that you're about to die. <laughs> so, hey, so, ladies and gentlemen, the eponym of the Vasilunas equation, the Vasilunas cell, the discoverer or predictor of region one and region two currents, et cetera, et cetera. World famous organist, indefatigable critic of scientific fiction as he sees it, Pro Professor Vitanus Vasilunas. Okay, so thank you, Georgia. <laughs> So I'd like to actually mention that the way I really started was not even as data analyst, I was a graduate student. I actually began by calibrating some instruments. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why I feel so comfortable in asking questions from experimenters about the, the instruments, because I uh, did actually do some work on them a long time ago. And this, uh, George also failed to, to, to mention uh, one thing which I have in common with Van Allen, you know, after whom this lecture series uh, is named. 
when I came to my tears as a graduate student, uh, I joined what was then still a cosmic ray group, uh, although in the process of transforming itself into a, a group of, uh, actually two groups, one in space plasma physics and the other one in X-ray astronomy. But it's still for several years a real cosmic ray group, and in, in a way I still feel myself as a cosmic ray physicist in a certain sense. And that is what Van Allen was. Van Allen really was a cosmic ray physicist, and his whole discovery of radiation belts and the studies of uh, particles among universes and so on was an outgrowth of his uh, work in cosmic rays. Uh, now, why would anyone want to study cosmic rays? Uh, well, there's only, really only one reason. You want to understand what goes on in nature. And I'll uh, make this uh, one of the key of uh, my talk today. What we as scientists we really want to do is understand uh, what goes on. Uh, let me go to the next one. And one who put this whole question very well of what it means to understand is uh, Eugene Parker, of the whom another lecture series is named. Uh, let me see. Okay. And I put a quotation from a short paper which he gave some 41 years ago in connection with a solar wind one user interaction. And as he points out, the phenomena are extremely complicated, and the details just go finer and finer. But what he wants is to understand in terms of basic laws of physics. And as he puts it, he wants to know how the observed effects follow from Newton, Maxwell, Lorenz, Schrodinger, etc. And we construct uh, idealized and simplified models for the purpose of demonstrating how all of this happens. And uh, further on, uh, I think the timer is not running. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> and further on, he points out even more uh, succinctly that they when uh, interest and ultimately understanding how the basic laws of physics lead to the various observed effects. And we construct theoretical models to show ourselves how the basic laws lead to the observed effect. So the aim is to understand the magnetosphere and the very highly complicated phenomena in the solar wind, magnetosphere, ionosphere, atmosphere interaction in terms of the basic laws of physics. Now, the basic laws which are important for our purpose are believed to be completely known. There's things like Higgs boson, of course, it doesn't, doesn't make any difference to the magnetosphere. And the other thing is an important aspect. Uh, now, we feel we do have all the basic equations in complete form. Now, the, probably the last time that uh, any, any reputable physicist seriously proposed uh, that we may have to modify, say, Maxwell's equations to explain something in, in, in geophysics. Uh, was well, 1947 when Black has suggested uh, that maybe different magnetic field is the result of some intrinsic magnetization of a rotating mass. Okay, today we don't believe that. I think we can explain all planetary fields by a dynamo mechanism. And for most purposes, uh, we really need to consider only classical, that is, non-quantum physics. Uh, now, the quantum effects are only peripherally Peripherally important for us in, in terms of providing cross sections and the reaction rates and what have you. This is partly because our medium is almost entirely gaseous, so we don't have to worry about solids or quantum effects, of course, are unavoidable. So if you look, look let's see a bit. I just want to advance in here. So now we can uh, look at the basic equations, uh, and then they are, and, th and that is a complete set for our purposes. We have uh, Maxwell's equations, uh, and then, uh, then we have the uh, momentum change of a particle in terms of the Lorentz force and the gravitational acceleration, and we have a uh, essentially Liouville's theorem or the Boltzmann equation, whatever you call it, which describes the distribution of particles in the gravitational uh, the field equation. And they say, this is everything we have. Everything that we have in the magnetosphere, we feel we can, in some way, understand as the result of these, uh, these equations. Uh, it even allowed for a special relativity, and I didn't specify the relation between momentum and velocity. 
The only thing I've left out is general relativity, you know, which is, uh, will replace this and Einstein's equation, but it's really of no importance for anything. Now, it was uh, Fred Hoyle who pointed out that uh, as a general property of physics, he was actually thinking more of Dirac's equation, but the same thing holds true, that the basic equations are extremely simple. They're amazingly simple. They're just a few equations, and suddenly the whole world f follows uh, from that. Uh, a lot of consequences are then extremely complicated. Uh, and that's a remarkable part. You have very basically simple equations uh, which then produce extremely complicated uh, effects. Uh, okay, so now I go into a more specific topic the development uh, of magnetic uh, spheric physics uh, and cosmic electrodynamics. Because uh, the magnetic sphere, of course, is uh, completely ionized for the most part. And, uh, all the effects we will see are essentially uh, of uh, electromagnetic in nature. And historically, one can divide this into three stages. Uh, what, I, what I call stage one really begins uh, with the fundamental insight of Alfvén, who was the first to really formulate this uh, as a uh, distinct uh, topic of study in his uh, classical monograph in 1950, Cosmical Electrodynamics. But the real, real insight uh, goes back, I think, to his uh, 1942 two-page paper in Nature in which he uh, derived uh, what are now known as the Alphane waves. And I'll uh, point out that this, this one basic insight uh, allows you by, very much by itself to explain uh, many of the basic structures of the magnetosphere, particularly the magnetophase, the bow shock, uh, the, the compression and draping of the magnetic field in the magnetosheath, uh, and with a few additional qualifications, you can also explain the difference between open and closed magnetosphere and the energy transfer into the magnetosphere and the electric field mapping and lots of number of things, other things. Notice stage two, which begins sort of around 1960 or 1970, it really consists of two separate developments, uh, essentially independent, which, which then uh, interacted in many ways. One is uh, Alfvén suddenly changes views. Uh, this is, uh, I won't say unique, but it's a very rare thing in, uh, in, in science, that he uh, completely changed his attitude on how the uh, cosmic electrodynamics should be studied and introduced what he called the second approach, uh, you know, in which he uh, certainly renounced MHD completely, uh, put great emphasis on electric fields and currents, uh, various anomalous effects, and so on. And uh, at about the same time, or a little bit later, was the development uh, of the magnetic ionospheric coupling theory. And the main impetus for that was to explain magnetic convection and all the associated phenomena. And I'll point out that is saying a lot, saying it explains all of that. Uh, and in the third stage, uh, there's no specific time, but sort of, I guess, the like 80s and 90s. Who, we began to be concerned about questions about a lot of time varying phenomena. And substance, of course, played a major role in, in this development uh, and stabilities. And uh, people began asking questions about uh, what, is, what is cause and effect uh, in the and, and that's what this controversy that George already alluded to between the uh, VV and EJ approach that came in. And so I have something to say about that as well. Now, what is the basic, what I call the basic insight of Alphane is actually. Is, in some ways, very simple, and it's based on the elementary result, which you all, all know from uh, freshman ENM, that uh, if you have an ele electric field and you have, say, two charged particles, one plus, one minus, the electric field uh, pulls those particles apart, uh, if, no, if nothing else uh, pre prevents it. But now those two particles uh, have their own electric field, uh, which is opposite to the field that's pulling them out, uh, pulling them apart, uh, that's un unavoidable. So with many, particles, many pairs of particles, so you will create a field which is opposing the field you had initially. And so as, as a result, uh, if you have enough particles, you will end up, what we say, shorting out uh, the electric field. Of course, we all know what that means. We just uh, put a set of wires across a conductor, and a big spark, and the field goes away. Kid said that was well known a long time ago. But what Alfvén realized was uh, 
the electric field, but in the presence of, of a magnetic field, the electric field defends the frame of reference. And so if, a, if your collection of particles is moving, the electric field in its, in its own frame will be different from what it is in the laboratory. And, and so the, the, the uh, shortening out uh, will only occur in the frame in which the medium is addressed. Now, some of wondered, uh, why did it take until 1942 for all fine waves to be discovered? Uh, now, could someone else have discovered them? Uh, say, could Maxwell or could Lorenz? Well, okay, Maxwell couldn't, because he didn't know about the optic field depending on the frame of reference. Uh, for him, his equations only held in the ether frame. Well, certainly Lorenz, who first realized the transformation properties, he could have derived the principle of vane waves. So I think Kelvin couldn't, for the same reason as Maxwell, but the younger Rayleigh could. And, there are, and the Horace Lamb in his classical hydrodynamics in the sixth edition has, in fact, a, one, a couple of pages, or a page uh, on forces due to currents in a conducting, conducting fluid. Just consider just the current, no, nothing else. So, you know, it's, uh, but in any case, uh, the first person to really see that if a medium can move, the everything changes was Alphane, and then it, it sort of derived the waves. So the basic insight is that uh, if you allow the medium to move, there is sort of one special frame in which uh, if the charges are freely move movable, the field will be reduced to a negligibly small value. Not necessarily zero, but to a very small value. Okay, so the question which has to be raised, which really isn't, is uh, small compared to what? And we'll come back to that later. Now, this is the essence of what usually has a fancy name. It's called the MHD approximation. But in a way, it's, it's nothing more than saying that uh, in, a, in a medium which uh, charges can move freely, in its own frame, the electric field should be very small. And then the uh, electric field in any other frame is uh, given by the usual transformation law. And then in a well-known way, you can derive all the well-known consequences of uh, flux preservation and everything else. Now, for the magnetosphere, you can use this concept alone. To first of all, explain why there is a magnetophos at all. Why do you have a boundary between an external plasma and an uh, internal magnetic field? It would say very little plasma to begin with. Uh, now, this was done, of course, by Jaffer uh, and Ferraro first uh, before Alvain. But what they did was, in effect, derive the MHD approximation for their special case. Uh, they went through all the uh, arguments about uh, charges moving in the uh, moving electric fields and so on. So you can understand uh, the magnetophores. You can understand, uh, given that, you can understand uh, the, the bow shock, given the solar wind flow is uh, supersonic. You can understand how the field is draped around the magnetophores. Uh, this is a spiker and oxygen and others. So, you can't quite understand, you cannot completely understand the Monero tail. That, that takes uh, something more complicated uh, as to why the field is stretched out this way. Why is that a current sheet? Uh, now, if you allow for the fact that the, this is all only approximation, then you can even conceive the possibility of an open Monero sphere where the field lines uh, connect uh, from inside to outside. The connection itself, you cannot, you cannot understand in terms of just MHD approximation. But given that it occurs, then you, can, well, then you have an open field lines, you can understand how the energy gets transferred into the magnetosphere. That's very often misunderstood. And the people think that the connection somehow plays an essential role in energy transfer. Well, the connection, of course, was largely invented to explain how you convert energy from magnetic field into plasma. But here we have the opposite. You have the question of uh, how you convert energy from the plasma flow into magnetic energy. And for that, all you need is open magnetosphere and stresses at the boundary. And then you can calculate the energy conversion, and it all works uh, very well. You can understand the flow on open field lines. What you cannot understand uh, on this basis is the flow on closed field lines. Now, you can realize that there has to be some flow on closed field lines. But how do you calculate it? What determines that? And, and that is what really led to the second stage, what they call the ionosphere coupling theory. It was uh, developed uh, 
very largely to try to understand uh, how do you, do you calculate the, the flow in, in the magnetosphere, in the closed part of the magnetosphere. Now, as George mentioned, that I sort of contributed to one of the basic papers, and at the same time, Dick Wolf uh, developed a similar scheme and later implemented that in the nice convection model. But the basic ideas were floating around before, and particularly Jules Fair, back in 1964, did have a complete scheme, but only with a very special model, which he calculated. Uh, and Dan Swift also had many important contributions. <laughs> Now, this one is the answer coupling theory. I think it can, has some claim to being the, the single most successful theory of magnetospheric physics. Now, it explains uh, convection, allows it to be calculated in detail, and how it varies with the insolvent conditions. It predicts the existence and the special distribution of what are called region one currents, and it explains and predicts region two currents. And it can be successfully used to model plasma transfer to, uh, in the inner magnetosphere. Well, let me just uh, show the uh, basic scheme in the form in which I published it in 1970, using uh, with the terminology used then. Today, I would see, perhaps use different uh, phrases on that. The basic idea is that this is all self-consistent scheme. So you, you start, say, anywhere, let's say, with particle pressure. And given the particle drifts or given the momentum equation, you can calculate the with the nickel current in the magnetosphere, which uh, was the divergence, was give you the parallel or the Birkeland current into the ionosphere. And, uh, and then in the ionosphere, you use the uh, hemispheric Ohm's law to calculate uh, the electric fields uh, given the, the current input. And then, and then you map it one way or another into the magnetosphere to get the plasma flow. And the flow will then determine the pressure distribution. So it's all completely self consistent. You need to specify uh, the boundary conditions for solar wind uh, and the particle sources. So let's a briefly look at, at the equations. Uh, what I call the kinetic equation is something uh, mis mis misleading terminology. It's not a kinetic in the usual sense, but it's just a transport equation. So it is the Boltzmann equation, or the moments as necessary. And you have the generalized Ohm's law, which is written in just uh, this form. I've included. Uh, the MHD term, the whole term, you can add anything else you want. You know, if you, yeah, it's very Ohm's law, current continuity, and momentum conservation. No, you, you don't use Faraday's law very much in this formulation, curiously enough. Now, the continuity of current, of course, it, where it comes from is uh, from uh, Amper's law, which I've written here in this form. In the atmospheric Ohm's law, is, uh, and this is uh, work with uh, Paul Song, which is basically something different. It really comes from the uh, momentum equation when you balance the J cross B force against the uh, friction and neutrals combined with the uh, generalized Ohm's law, including the whole term. And I've repeated the momentum conservation equation again. And I've written all of this in this peculiar form uh, to make a point uh, that where you see a zero on the left hand side, it really stands for a neglected time derivative. And this now points out to the, uh, the basic weakness of this whole scheme, that it is valid only in a steady equilibrium limit, because you have drafts all the time derivatives. And if you ask, uh, well, how, what, are, what are constraints? How fast can you move and still get away with it? Uh, well, the limit is essentially the travel time of the Alphane wave along the field line, that is. So the scheme is valid for time scales much longer than that. So you cannot use it to, to describe uh, any time variations other than slow changes from one quasi equilibrium to another. And in particular, you cannot describe any wave propagation effects. They're simply not in the theory. They're averaged out, if you will. What is more important, and I think is not generally appreciated, uh, that the whole theory is valid only for a stable equilibrium. The reason for that is that you're neglecting the time derivative in the momentum equation, that you're balancing the J cross B force uh, against all the mechanical forces. But in reality, it is a difference of, of those two forces which determines the plasma flow. So you're implicitly assuming uh, that if the two come out of equilibrium, the plasma will flow, that it will flow in such a way as to come back to equilibrium. 
And then by definition, that is stability. You perturb the system and it comes back uh, to steady, to, to back to an equilibrium, rather than continuing to grow. And finally, the formulation of the theories, mathematically, is very convenient. Uh, I think it's still the best uh, way of calculating things mathematically. There are many detailed points in which the mathematics uh, it really works beautifully. It's very convenient. But in many ways, it doesn't take the physical relationships. So. And it is those physical relationships which sort of became a, of interest by the time we began to worry about soft storms and very time dependent phenomenon. So, like a very simple example, in, in, in one, uh, one of the equations, so also one of some limits is uh, the energy approximation, that E equals some minus V equals B. So that says that the, if there is electric field, there must be a flow and vice versa. Well, now, which is the primary one? Which makes which? And there has been a division along those lines uh, ever since the beginning. Uh, I remember the late Bill McCormack, one of his meetings, uh, saying it was strange that people who measure electric fields usually express the results as equivalent flows, and people who measured flows usually express the results as equivalent electric fields. Uh, and that is actually uh, even true to, to date to some extent. Uh, the honest, the honest people uh, they have whole, whole papers and sessions devoted to, to electric fields near the equator. But they never, never measure them. What they measure is the flows of the plasma near the equator. Okay, so that's just one type of question. I think I'll skip this. And this all gradually led to a, what became known as the VV versus EJ controversy. VV meaning magnetic field uh, and the plasma flow. And this is an approach which, in fact, goes back to Alfane, what they call Alfane 1, the Alfane of the 1950 monograph. This is a classical MHD, as later developed uh, by Cowling and Dungey and and today, Parker is particularly a vocal advocate of this view. And in this view, it is in the plasma really is the magnetic field and the flow, which are the most important, and the current is calculated as the curl of V, and the electric field is calculated from the flow, from, from the uh, <coughs> micros V term, or, or whatever else is deemed appropriate. Now, the opposite approach, which is called the JE, or current electric field, uh, it also goes back to Alfane of a second approach. So Alfane is in unique position of being both sides of the controversy. And I've, of course, mentioned a few names at random. Walter Haeckel, of course, has been a very vocal advocate of this, and uh, Tony Louis. Well, Jan Song, I'll have to make a vote qualification on that later on. Uh, and so now, now the question is, uh, now how do you decide on questions like this? Let's just take E versus V. Okay, the equation valid in some limits. It says E equals uh, minus V cross V. And uh, now how do you decide? The, does it mean, even mean anything to decide which is the primary one? Now you can argue about causes. And uh, that's real philosophy, you know. Causes, what, what is a cause? Uh, what kind of causes? Efficient cause, formal cause? So I began to try to look for some ways. Can you do it in, in terms of physics? Uh, Instead of these verbal arguments, which usually lead to nowhere. And then uh, there was an important contribution. Uh, which I went back and I remember something which was said by our, by our source of mine, and Joe Siskos and Alex Klimas' thesis supervisor, Stan Albert at MIT. And what he pointed out was something which is uh, so obvious, uh, strange, that no one ever mentions in textbooks. Uh, and that is that, uh, that is in classical meaning uh, non-quantum uh, uh, physics. So the equations are all in evolutionary form. So you can, uh, the time derivative of any quantity is given uh, by a function of all the other quantities and the derivatives of the, the space derivatives at the, f the present time, with three exceptions. The divergence equations uh, have no time derivatives. So. So you can imagine any initial condition you want, as, as long as you satisfy the divergence conditions. So, and then the equations will tell you what happens later on. So for example, I cannot imagine electric fields pointing to, toward the point in, in vacuum, because it violates the divergence condition. But I can very well imagine the magnetic field loops in empty space. At t equals zero, they will be there and they'll go away at the speed of light. So. And therefore, if you want to decide, uh, does a Q1 produce Q2? 
The obvious thing to do is to assume an initial condition that t equals zero, and only q1 is present, but not q2, and then solve the full equations. You have to solve the full equations. You can't do that approximations, and, and see if you actually do, do develop uh, that too. Well, okay, these are the evolutionary equations, just repeating once again. So, so one thing I first looked at was the relation between E and V. And I just did just this calculation. In case one, assume that T equals zero, you have an electric field, E zero, in some particular frame, and no flow, V equals zero. And then what you find that, this, uh, that after the system settles uh, in the steady state, in a very short time, in a plasma period time scale, the electric field has been reduced uh, to a small value, to so our fine speeds over C squared, the uh, initial value, and there is a corresponding very small flow. But you certainly do not get that flow in e, e, initial E cross V. Whereas in the opposite case, if I start with a zero electric field but the given flow, you produce uh, very nearly the, the electric field you need to have the, the flow, slightly reduced to well, again, this is the same factor of V alpha and over C squared. Okay, so I published this in 2001, and then last year, after I retired, I had to clear my office in, in Lindo and I discovered a lot of things that have been forgotten and, or not, not seen before. And one of them was a reprint of a paper by Wunemann, by Oscar Wunemann. This is Lee Wunemann of the Wunemann Fall Instability and many other things. In 1992, but it is exactly the same calculation, but just a special case. You see, uh, injecting a plasma into the magnetic field. Uh, and you got the same result, and his calculation is identical to the one I did. Uh, so I gladly acknowledge that uh, this work was actually done by somebody else long before that. Uh, now, a simple understanding of that is, uh, listen, so supposing I do this initial value problem, an analytic field, I inject, say, two particles, the ions will go this way, the electrons the other way, and the electric field that, that they produce is opposite to the imposed field. Now, with two particles, it makes no difference. But if I add more and more and more particles, uh, eventually I will appreciably reduce this electric field. Now, if you ask uh, how much you reduce it, or what is the, the final field, then you get exactly the, the value that's, uh, that I said before. It's this uh, reduction with a large factor of a faint speed over speed of light squared. Or another way of looking at it is, is that this uh, initial field has to have charges which are in opposite sense to that. And so plasma, in essence, polarizes and eliminates uh, the initial electric field, or very nearly eliminates that. Uh, now, if I insist on maintaining this electric field, I keep supplying more charge to the plates to keep uh, the field uh, at its full value. To, to do that, I must be driving a current. Uh, and the current goes through the plasma, and, and the J plus V force accelerates the plasma. So it is not the electric field that gives you the, the flow, but the, 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 the force, the J plus V force, uh, which uh, allowed the, the field to be there. Now, in, the, in the other case, if we just start to, with a flow with no field, then you very easily, the charge separation is enough to produce the field that you need. So in summarizing this, you can say that as long as the alpha speed is uh, small compared to the speed of light, which means that the uh, inertia of the plasma is dominated by the mass of the plasma and not by the energy equivalent mass of the magnetic field, then the plasma flow will produce an electric field, uh, but the field will not produce the plasma flow. And this can be looked at as, uh, as a consequence of the fact that the electric field basically prevents the charges from separating uh, appreciably. And so the electrons and the ions have to flow very nearly together. And since the ions are heavy, it cannot be changed. Uh, it is the electron. The electric field is such as to change the electron flow to match the flow of the ions. OK, and you establish this uh, equilibrium condition, say, in a very short time scale, uh, like an electron plasma period. So to make a flow, you really need to exert forces, not electric fields. You really need a real force acting on the plasma, which will accelerate it to produce the flow. OK, I think I'll skip this lack of time. OK, well, now, with this result, I thought I'd to tackle a somewhat more difficult problem of the relation between B and J. 
Now, if you're some, this is, uh, we're very much used to, in the very beginning, is thinking of J as being something that produces B. That is, you have a current, and a, that produces the magnetic field. And if you look at Maxwell's equations, uh, of course, that's what you get. Uh, the, the, the full equation for J, for, for B, excuse me, is a wave equation in which the source term is the curl of J. So really, it's the curl of your current which is the field and not the current itself, but that's a minor detail. Similarly, the electric field is produced for the time derivative of the current and so on. But you need to know the, the current or the curl of the current over the entire light cone, past light cone, or the, or the pointer. And the false boundary conditions of that. So you can c compute the field given the current for all previous times. Now the question is, can you do that for the plasma? Can you in fact assume that you know the current from all previous times? Well, let's look at the equation for the current. The current density is defined in terms of distribution with this equation. And you can easily compute the time rate of change of the current uh, by just simply taking the appropriate moments of a distribution function. It is given by this equation, which is exact, except from the being non nonadristic, because everything is, is in there. You can even average without I want to go into that. But uh, I'll simplify the notation by just uh, calling all of these terms E star. It is just notation. So change of J is equal. Uh, uh, to the uh, electric field uh, minus some combination of flows and everything else, pressure gradients. Uh, and if the electric field, uh, this difference is non zero, the current will change uh, a second plasma period time scale. So now we can uh, look at the relation between uh, curl B and J. Now, in, in general, curl B minus J is the time derivative of E, and there's no reason in general why curl B and J ha have to be equal. If I start with other initial conditions, they'll be different. If I change one or the other, they'll be different. Uh, J is just four particles. They can flow any way that they want. Uh, but if there is a difference, because uh, there will be an electric field, uh, we should do two things. Uh, now, the electric field uh, will try to, to, to change the magnetic field on, on a time scale of the uh, light travel time. It's just. Uh, Electromagnetic waves traveling away. In the other laboratory, this is what happens. But in this room, I uh, try to change the, the difference between J and curl B. The, the changes of the field will change on a time scale of the light tidal time, which is very short in this room. But in the plasma, there is an additional effect uh, that E will also change the current density. And the time scale for that is, is a plasma period. So which one wins depends on relative time scales. And the ratio is just the uh, length of the electron inertia length. Uh, so if the scale is larger than that, uh, and, and I point out the, for the density of one cubic centimeter, the scale is about uh, five kilometers. Uh, on larger scales, if curl B and J are not equal, then J will change uh, long before B can. Uh, and so in effect, uh, the current density adjusts itself uh, to match the existing curl B. OK, so one can uh, in some ways by saying that the J is determined by the motion of all charged particles. And there is no a priori reason why, why it should be equal to curl B. And the quality only is established by displacement current term. And at this point, I should mention uh, there is at least one person who saw this long before I did, and that is Yan Song. Although she never said it in a way that's clear to anybody very, very much, but I acknowledge that they, she did see this essential role of displacement current uh, long before anybody else. And so this is one way in which the plasma differs fundamentally from what we're used to in the laboratory, that, uh, that J changes to, to match curl B and not the other way around. Okay, I think I'll skip this when I'm a little bit out of time. Okay, now if you ask how does current in practice uh, develop, uh, well, the other important equation, which goes back to the Parker, has been derived at least twice independently of the other people since, uh, is that if you add all the, all the drift of particles, the gradient, the polarization, and the curvature of the drift, uh, and the polarization drifts, and the gravitational term, and so on, then then what you get is just a momentum equation. 
so that uh, so the current uh, uh, the kernel of V, if you will, adjusts itself uh, to, to match whatever is required uh, by, the, by, the, by the stress of the particles, uh, by the stress of the plasma, so the net uh, stress. And so now if, if you go to a, the usual more or less stable equilibrium situation, if we again start with the J cross B being out of balance with the mechanical stress, the plasma will, will begin to flow, and the velocity changes initially in proportion to, to, that, to the time. Now, the change of the flow implies, of course, a change of the electric field, and the curl of that implies a change of the magnetic field, which now changes as time squared. And it is the, the curl of that uh, changed field which is the current. Uh, see, this is how the current develops, and not by driving anything, but by changing magnetic field, uh, and the curl of the field is the current. Uh, until ultimately you reach, uh, again, a stress equilibrium, and the time scale for that is the Alfane travel time. So if you want to look at uh, what happens to currents in the spaces, so you'll have to look at the stresses acting on the plasma. So then, in summary, the, the way to look at large-scale plasmas is that the, the electric field is essentially determined by generalized Ohm's law. That's the part they have to skip in detail. Then at, in the time derivative is given by the curl of the electric field, so determined, and the current density is simply the curl of V. The particle motions uh, can be calculated in, in the way one usually does it, by the result of all the forces acting on the plasma. But saying that the current density is equal to curl of V implies a constraint on the motions, and that constraint is enforced by the electric field from step one. The electric field uh, is exactly such as to maintain the divergence of J equal to zero and everything else. Now this is the beginning to look at the prescription for a computer simulation. In the next figure I show the regions of validity of various approximations on the plot of length scale versus time scale. You know, now this is the sphere of light because there's nothing physically in this other quadrant. This is a faint speed and is a plasma frequency, the general frequency, in a typical length scale. Now, what I've described is basically what's called a hybrid approach, and it's, it's valid uh, on length scales larger than the electron inertial length. And automatically, this uh, means uh, time scales uh, less than a year, uh, excuse me, longer than the electron plasma period. Now, MHD is valid in a much more restricted range, length scales uh, larger than the ion inertial length, and time scales longer than the uh, Iron gyro period. Now, the uh, MI coupling theory, the Dreis convection model, is only valid for length time scales much longer than the Alfheimer travel time and only for stable systems. So, but it can be implemented to very small length scales. It has actually no intrinsic limit to a length scale that you can deal with if you're willing to put enough terms in your drift equations. Now, the ordinary laboratory is actually this limit to time scales. Uh, short compared to the plasma period and long compared to the light travel time. So this is almost orthogonal to anything we see in space. And everything else is fully kinetic, right? There are no restrictions. But you're also following all time scales, including plasma oscillations. So at the end, I'll finally say a few words about simulations, and I'll begin by mentioning one of the stories about Vicky Weisskopf, who was sort of, uh, for those in geophysics, he was actually a very famous uh, nuclear and particle physicist, uh, I knew him as chairman of the department at MIT. And he had sort of a, he really wanted to understand the basic terms, love of physical phenomena. And so the story is, he once asked the meteorologist, uh, why do all the winds come from the west for the most part? Uh, the meteorologist showed him a printout of the general circulation model, of all the arrows uh, going east, and the biggest comment was, well, maybe the computer understands it, but how about you and me? <laughs> and uh, so at the end, I'll say a few words about computer simulations. I think a simulation really should be designed as to help us understand the, that, not just the computer. Uh, so so the, there should be specific questions that the simulation is designed to answer, and I, I've given a, a few examples uh, in here, but you can, basic questions which are, I think, un, un, are unsolved. If, uh, well, I'll try to skip this a little bit. Uh, Well, just make two more points. If you do a fully kinetic simulation, of course, you're following in detail every plasma oscillation. 
Well, it's the answer, for example, so, say one to ten minutes, there's about a million plasma oscillations. So. so the question is, do we really think that to understand the onset, we have to follow the million oscillations in detail? Of course, for, for instance, computers can't do it in detail because you, can, you can't do it. So you have to essentially cheat and uh, use uh, artificial mass ratios, uh, landscapes, and so on to reduce the number from a million. Uh, what if we really had to understand the, the answer to follow the million oscillations, there should be a million different substance worlds in this principle. And if we did an ideal simulation using all the full equations, all the inputs, and it reduced exactly what is observed, then my claim is then we have learned nothing about the physics. We have learned a lot about this from numerics. What all we would have done is essentially confirm that the, the results can be understood in terms of basic equations, which we knew already. So in closing, I just uh, had a, uh, once read a joke about the medical context, which I adapted uh, to our context, which says that a, a theorist knows little, understands much, a experimenter knows much, understands little. And the computer simulator, unfortunately, in many cases, I find it's almost little true. He knows everything, understands nothing. Now, the ideal scientist, of course, uh, which again, unattainable, is someone who would uh, really understand everything without uh, knowing not, nothing. Uh, so, thank you very much. Uh. Well, thank you very much, Vitenis. The uh, Space Physics and Aeronomy section would like to make a presentation of this Certificate of Appreciation to Vitenis for making this uh, presentation today. And we hope that when we visit him, we'll see it on his wall. Thank you, Vitenis. <laughs> I must say that I'm one of those that uh, used to stand in front of this audience uh, shaking with dread. And I must also say that I'm one of those who used to talk about the electric field in the magnetosphere that was being mapped onto the ionosphere. So uh, I've been a victim of this very controversy because of my misunderstanding of how the things work. So I see one hand immediately here, Yan Song. Uh, would you like to ask a question? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or by tennis, will never yeah. remember it yeah. to the end. This is my comment, the last okay. word. Okay. Yeah. Uh, to, if you want uh, to see the state, uh, to summarize the state of theoretical development uh, in my little physics, I think uh, right now is the state to discover not just weight, or also the other part of weight. Finally, Bob Lesson is my collaborator. I would like to discuss with you my point. Uh, Anytime. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Yansong. Yeah. 
Do we have another question or comment uh, that <laughs> poor Vitenis could answer here? <laughs> Would you like to say something in response or just wait for later? Well, let me say I can say that I, uh, as I understood most of the comments to do with sort of how does it evaluate uh, you know, Alvain's contribution to all of this. And uh, I think maybe at this point I should like to make another quotation from Fred Hoyle. But yeah, I do claim to be an expert in science fiction. I've read uh, all of his 18 novels. Uh, on that. And one of them, one of the characters, uh, says that in, in science and mathematics, uh, it is not who speaks uh, that matters, but only what is said. Tony? Tony? Yeah, I wouldn't quarrel with that, but uh, see, the electric force on a plasma as a whole is the electric field from the charge density, and that is negligible. I mean, the equations are very clearly show that, the, if it's, as I said, if you start with electric field and no flow, the flow does not develop except to a very small extent. Uh, and, I, uh, and I think one of the essential points in applying the equations is to stick to the equations uh, and not go into philosophizing about what it means. Uh. So I think what you say is correct, but nothing changes any of my conclusions. Uh. Well, the next session is about to start, and I'd like to yeah. thank our speaker once again. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for coming to this session. It was a full crowd, and we appreciate your attendance.